Disclaimer, I know nothing about education. Uh, I happen to work at a university. Um, that's the closest, and I went to a university, so I guess that makes me uh, uh, part of the education system, but, but I know nothing about education. Uh, so instead of trying to make some link and, and say something smart, I thought what I could do is tell you guys a little bit about um, what I've been trying to do for the past sort of six to nine months um, around getting um, other smart people um, doing things that are sort of at the intersection of using data for, for sort of public good, for social good. Um, and, and really the motivation for this um, work came from um, spending a lot of time sort of um, working on honestly pointless things. Um, and wow, somebody agrees or disagrees, I, I can't tell. <laughs> um, and so when you sort of talk to the People, people like me with sort of data mining and machine learning and sort of tech backgrounds, and you talk about something social, you know, they, this is what they think about, right? So pick up your favorite company, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, Bitly, Feedburner, all those sort of things. That's what sort of social means for them. And a lot of us work on these types of problems, um, not because they're critical, important problems, you know, the, um, improving the search results from number five to number three is you know one of the that's what all of Google's working on, or improving the probability of you clicking on an ad from 0.00034 percent to 0.00036 percent is what they spend all day. Um, and while that's exciting in some abstract intellectual world, it's not necessarily very useful. Um, so what I've been trying, that was sort of my motivation of you know that's the world I've been in, and wanted to sort of see how we could take the same techniques. Um, that are doing that and, and, and do something more useful and have people sort of start caring about you know, problems in um, education, for example, uh, healthcare and, and sustainability and public safety. Um, and I know nothing about those areas either. So um, all I was sort of starting with was I'd like to do something that um, enables people like me to be more involved in, in, in doing good. Um, and so one of the things I, I thought I would tell you about today, which is very early stages. Um, I'm not going to have any great results. Uh, I'm certainly not going to have all uh, the nice things that Yvonne had and lots of examples of things she's done over you know, her lifetime. I haven't really done anything. So what I'll do is kind of give you small examples of things we've started doing, um, examples where um, data really has the potential to help improve a lot of social problems. Um, it's not the answer. Um, that's sort of the final answer, but it helps you move towards the right, right answer. Um, so one of the things I, I did um, last summer was um, run a program called uh, Data Science for Social Good. And the, the objective for that program was to really get um, people with computer science and statistics and econometrics and, and any sort of and sociology and public policy people to come and start working on sort of getting exposed to problems that impact uh, social, social good. So examples of projects. I'm going to give you some examples. Um, I'm going to try. I, I, I really don't like showing videos during talks. But I'm going to try this. It's such the first time in my life I'm doing this. We sort of made a quick video of the program. And, and I'm only showing this because I don't want to be the one talking about this, even though I have 30 seconds in there. But I want to sort of give you guys a flavor of what the program was in terms of the people who were part of the program. So I'll, I'll play that video. The goal of the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship is really to take data scientists and train them to work on problems to solve problems that actually matter. And what I mean by that is people who have computer science and statistics and economics and policy and analytical skills, giving them an environment where they learn how to not only solve real problems, but focus on problems that have social impact in areas such as education and energy and healthcare and transportation and public safety. So what we wanted to do was build this hybrid person who has all these different skills but also understands how to take real problems, communicate with people about those problems, solve them, and then help figure out a way to transfer and, and, and transition those solutions into the real world to the partner organizations. I saw this advertisement for the fellowship and it said data science 
and social good. And I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's exactly what I'm looking for, something that has all the neat data, technology, those interesting problems, those fun problems, those hard problems, um, but problems in the area of social good, something that is able to improve people's lives. I heard about the program through my advisor. Uh, it really pulled me in since the beginning just because I understand the amount of good that you can do with a little bit of data. The reason that we're doing this program with Argonne and the University of Chicago, and the reason that this is the right place to do this, is that this is one of the few places where we have the right expertise in the system sciences and then the social sciences to bring together and to answer these questions in a way that's much more holistic than just looking at one or the other. My background is in astrophysics, and I found that coming from the hard sciences to this program was a really interesting transition because I was still working with students, but I was doing so in a way that was expected to produce results rather than just papers. I'm working with Nurse Family Partnership. They're a home visitation program. They send nurses into the homes of at-risk women, first-time mothers. My team is working with a new government organization called the Cook County Land Bank. We're creating a new analytical tool to help the organization decide which properties to invest in to have the greatest impact in reversing neighborhood decline. Our project this summer was working with Mesa Public Schools to identify cases of missed educational opportunities and ensure that students go to colleges that best serve their educational potential. My team is working with the CTA. We're working on a problem that affects a lot of people around many cities, which is crowding on buses. There have been a lot of learning lunches, a lot of talks, and a lot of just person-to-person -person opportunities uh, you know, to hit the whiteboard and you know, to be learning different programming tools, uh, you know, different uh, packages within tools. A lot of people, when they came in, they really cared a lot about technical problems and what you sort of notice is they start talking to our partners they go out in the field and see how things these things get implemented how the data is actually collected so they went from thinking of a spreadsheet or a database as a data set to um, actual people behind them actual um, stories The goal is to provide these women with a source of support and health education. Hopefully this will make Bike Share a more viable part of our public transit system. By inferring a lot of these funding relationships, we let nonprofits spend a lot less time searching for information on the web and actually doing the work that they're trying to do to make the world a better place. Thank you for your time. We started off from such different backgrounds, from such different parts of the world, and we've really come together with this common purpose and, and goal. You'll spend your mornings at City Hall working to understand the problem the city faces, then afternoons coding together as a team trying to solve that problem. Each day is so full and fulfilling, you can't wait for the next one. I can't think of a better way to spend your summer. I wish I could do DSSG for the rest of my life, honestly. It's been a lot of fun. And this is the kind of work I want to do. You know, I'm interested in applying quantitatively grounded analyses and ways of thinking to problems that, you know, really keep me up at night, to problems that I think really matter. So, um, so, it's a bit long, and, and it's more sort of meant as a, we're trying to recruit more partners from governments and nonprofits to part, run, run this program again next summer. Um, and that was sort of the purpose of this, this thing. But I wanted to kind of give you guys a feel of, of students involved and, 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 and sort of the people who are running the program. And I thought I can talk about sort of two, two aspects. Of it. One, because this is, you know, we're talking about education, I can sort of tell you a little bit about um, what did we learn from running a program like this from the educational side? How did we influence some of the students who came in? And two, I can tell you about some of the projects that we were working on. A couple of them were related to education um, and, and kind of go, go from there. So the, the things we, you know, initially when we started this program, um, the idea was to get people from different areas who have good skills in, in sort of technical areas, right? Computer science and statistics and data analysis, um, but haven't had the, have, and have the interest in doing something good with it, 
just haven't had the opportunity. So how can we bring them together, um, have them work in teams and motivate them by giving them access to um, these problems where they are working with specific partners. They're not kind of sitting in a corner um, in front of a computer. A lot of that time was spent you know, out in the field talking to people who are affected by the services they're optimizing, um, consuming the services, talking to you know, the nurses, going to talk to schools, talking to kids about their education system. So a lot of time was already spent exposing them to the problems they were trying to solve as opposed to sitting on a, on a computer um, doing a lot of the data analysis. And then the second thing that was important was having them sort of, they giving them a community where they knew everybody else cared about the same things. Um, where everybody else in this program also had the same motivations. It wasn't, um, uh, it was sort of having the shared set of motivations gave them a community that they were really excited about. And so when they were leaving this program, our goal was to get them a little bit more likely to follow up and do these types of things once they leave. Um, and we sort of already saw things happening where a lot of uh, people changed what they were gonna do next. So if they were finishing uh, university, they decided, you know, I don't wanna go into this. There was one person who was um, going to work at an online ad company. And in the middle of the program, he emailed them and he actually sat down with me, like, how do I tell them I don't wanna do this? And I, well, just tell them you don't wanna do this. Uh, and so we sat down and he wrote this, he wrote this email together, telling their, his, his you know, employer that I really don't wanna go, go back and do that again and I'd rather do something else. Um, and so we saw sort of this change happening even in the middle of the summer. And what was interesting was that there were, there were a lot of people like that who have wanted to do something like this but never had the opportunity. So when we started the program, we gave people two weeks to apply for this, and it was a very last minute program. We said, you know, here's what we're doing, apply by you know, mid-March, and apply by April 1st. We got about 600 applications, um, which is not a large number, um, but given um, the timing, you know, we were surprised by that. Um, and so we picked about 35, 36 students to, to come into this program. Um, and then this program ran with about 12 different projects. So we had projects with you know, a lot of different, um, sorry, where are they? Um, with a lot of different partners. So, so each partner was either a government organization um, that we worked with or a nonprofit. Um, and the, 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 over the summer, what we ended up doing was either doing some sort of an analysis with them um, or uh, giving them some sort of tools that we built for them. Um, and a lot of these things are continued to be used. So one of the interesting, couple of interesting projects there that, that I wanna sort of mention, um, around education was a lot of things we've talked about this morning was about how, how people learn and how do you make the learning process better and how do you make you know, uh, uh, the curriculum more effective. Um, a lot of the work that, that I've been focused on is um, there are better people to do that than me. I don't have any experience in education. Um, what the focus I, I, I've been sort of looking at education is how do I give people better access to education? Assuming that the educators can do their job how do you even get them to the point where they have access to that information? Or how do you give them a means to fulfill their potential in some way? You know, if, and so edu online education is great, but that often takes the, the motivation to go and consume that information. If you don't have that motivation, why would you ever go there? Um, and so one of the things that happens, um, and this is more of a, a, a US problem, is, um, you know, is a lot of students, when you look at sort of data, it turns out there are a lot of students um, in, uh, in the US in high school systems who are qualified to do really to go to a good college, graduate, and be successful. They end up not applying to college, not going to college, or going to a college that is much, much um, lower than their potential, which means that they end up having a lower graduation rate, which often means um, bad or worse outcomes in the future. So one of the things that the project worked with was with uh, a school system in Arizona. And um, turned out they were struggling with, a lot of their students were uh, well qualified, but they would end up going to this, what's called the community college in the US, which is a two year university that is supposed to sort of prepare you for college. Um, but often they are not very high quality universities. So what happens is in that particular case, their graduation rate was about 12%. Uh, so only about 12% of people who went to that university finished that university. Um, as opposed to uh, other larger universities nearby which had a much, much, much higher graduation rate. So one of the things they were struggling with was they wanted to figure out 
how can we detect who are the students who are at risk of that behavior, which is um, the ability to go to college and graduate, uh, and then, but not applying to college or applying to uh, a worse college and graduate at a much lower rate. Um, and you can sort of imagine, and, and, and you know, th this is being, this is a, um, you can sort of sit down and, and, and talk to every student and figure this out. But it's a much, much, much easier task if you have all the data about these students. And so what they had was, uh, they kind of came to us saying, well, we think that there's a data problem where, where we have, they, we've been collecting data about all these students, about their uh, classroom behavior, about their activities, about their test scores, about what they study. Um, and we've been putting this together for a long time. We just have no idea what to do with it. Uh, can you help us in some way by, by making some sense of it and helping us um, figure out who are the students we should focus on in order to try to get them to change their behavior, try to get them to go and apply to certain colleges. Um, and the reason people don't go to college, there's sort of many reasons. Some of them are, it's just not the right thing for them, and that's perfectly fine. Some of them, but there are enough people who just don't know enough about the process. They don't know how to apply to college. They don't know anyone else in their surrounding neighborhood who has gone to college. Uh, they think it's too expensive to go to college, um, even though there are opportunities available for, for subsidizing that. They think it's too hard to apply. They don't know where to apply. They don't know how to apply. Um, so there are all sorts of, of, of reasons why things don't happen the way they should. And they had to wanted to figure out who should they focus on? How do they prioritize the set of students that they should really focus on um, who are most likely at risk of that behavior? So we spent the summer, um, one of the projects over the summer, one of the 12 different projects, was taking data from them, um, which we had sort of data about the school uh, behavior, and then we had data about their uh, college performance. So did they finish college? Uh, did they enroll in college? Did they apply in college? And what we're able to do from that is build models that, that are predictive of two things. One is predictive of if they go to college, a four-year college or university, that they will graduate. And so you take people who are, who are uh, highly likely to do that. And then the second model is to predict their likelihood to not apply to one of those colleges. Um, so now you have two probabilities for each person. You know how likely they are to succeed in college if they, if they go, and you have a probability of how likely they are to even apply uh, to these colleges. So now you can take the, the, the difference um, and see uh, which students are at highest risk of not applying to college, but if they were to apply, they would be really successful, and rank every student in, in every school. Um, now, that only takes care of one part of the problem. Now you can identify all the different students who you should be doing something to. Um, the second problem still remains is, once you know who they are, how do you change their behavior? Um, and that's the part that we, we haven't, we've just started doing now. Um, and, but when we gave them this, so in, initial, we gave them a list of um, all of their schools. We gave them to the top uh, 50 students in each school who are at risk of doing that. Um, and we also gave them a list of the bottom 50 school, 50 people who are you know, supposedly well prepared, they're doing fine, just as sort of validation because, it, just because we gave them, you know, uh, uh, um, we told them we built the model doesn't mean it's a good model. So we wanted them to validate some of these things. And so they went back and, and looked at some more data. Um, and they found, they sort of, they, they had done some surveys since they gave us the data. And they looked at the, some of the surveys and they found that um, the people on the top of our list, when asked where you're applying to college, had sort of empty, completely blank forms. Um, and then people who were at the bottom of our list had written down a very good list that knew what they were doing. So that was kind of good for um, them to believe, you know, we had done all the, all the stats part right, but they still had to validate that um, looking at this data. And so what they started doing based on that is started to talk to these students. So they have, they're now they're coming up with a, a program with the school uh, system where the school, there are these guidance counselors who help you get into college. So they're coming up with a program which will focus their efforts on these students um, and start talking to them about their college plans and trying to get them to figure out uh, is college the right thing for them? Should they be applying to them? Giving them more focus. And so it's, it's a start, but, but what's really important here is that, you know, what we really focused on was the first piece and we didn't really do much on the second piece. What we're sort of more interested and more excited in is how do you, so a lot of people who deal with data often 
sort of stop at that point where um, they take some data, they model some behavior, and they predict people's behavior, and then they stop at that. And they, okay, great, I can predict everything about you, I'm done. Um, what sort of we often miss is the second piece of, uh, great, I can predict something about you, how do I change that behavior if it's not the behavior that's, that's good? Um, and good is very subjective, right? You could sort of argue um, in many ways, good could be, um, you know, depending on, on who you, what side you're on, you could define good in, in your own way. But behavior change is often not connected to a lot of the work that uh, people with, with more data and analytical uh, backgrounds do. It's often, I'm gonna predict it and I'll just stop there. And so the kinds of things we're working towards more is seeing how do you actually affect behavior change um, in the presence of lots of data. So in the absence of data, you can sort of try, you know, people do that a lot, where they come up with hypotheses um, and they will take populations, things in small populations and, have, and figure out what changes behavior. Um, could you make this more efficient given that you have a lot more data available, that you can build predictive models of behavior? How, what do you do with that? Does that make things different? Um, so the other project that we were looking at um, in, in the same um, similar area um, was with, uh, um, there's a nonprofit here. It's a very different project. I'll kind of go over a few projects. This one was sort of an interesting project um, with a nonprofit. This is one in Kenya. And what they were, uh, they came out of uh, elections in Kenya. Um, and what, they, what happens in a lot of developing countries, and in even some developed countries, is there's a lot of corruption in when elections happen. And there's a lot of uh, uh, intimidation of, of voters. So the, there's a nonprofit that started from there, um, which was focused on building a crowdsourcing platform. It's a software platform that anybody, when an event happens, uh, whether it's an election or people have used it for earthquakes and, and other disasters, um, they, they create this infrastructure and it creates a, a, a text message number, a phone number, um, an email address, uh, a, you know, a Twitter account, all these different things. So people can send those types of messages about an event, about a disaster to this system. So they'll text message saying, you know, there's something going on over there. In the case of elections, it's, oh, there are, you know, they're not letting people vote in this place. Um, in the case of a disaster, there might be, you know, there's damage over there. Somebody needs medical help. So they keep throwing messages at the system. Um, and the way the system is run today, it's, um, it's extremely um, manual, where a system starts and human volunteers come in and they have to process this information. So information comes in, um, and there are lots of volunteers all over the world, um, except the me system, the messages are coming in different languages because it's a global system. Um, so the first thing they do is the message comes in, they have to decide, is this a language I understand? If not, they tag it with the language that's there. It goes back to the system, somebody translates it. Once it gets translated, um, somebody uh, categorizes it into what type of Thing they're asking about. Is it voter fraud? Is it some sort of medical uh, relief? Is it the supply needed somewhere else? Once they do that, then they go and redact personal information because there, there's some often information in there, especially if you look at things that involve um, governments, people don't, people put in there, you know, I'm at this phone number, call me, I need help here. Um, and you don't, and sometimes it's about, you know, I'm being intimidated by the police, um, uh, and you don't want the information to get public. So there's a whole process that happens here. And what they were really struggling with was they couldn't scale this. They just didn't have, information was coming in at a much, much, much faster rate. Um, and they couldn't process this information fast enough in order to be effective. They couldn't get enough volunteers. Um, so they came to us saying, you know, you know, all this seems to be doable at least semi-automatically, you could at least be able to identify the language, translate that, remove personal information, and categorize this into something that, that has one of these 10 categories. This is, this is about medical problem, this is about you know, um, damage, physical damage, this is about voter fraud, this is about something else. Um, and that's a problem that uh, people with, uh, again, machine learning and, and, and AI skills have been solving for a long, long time, just in a different context. And so what we were able to do is build a system for them, or basically augment their system over the summer um, that would do a first semi-automated pass at, fill, at doing all these things so they can then be presented to a human so they can correct the things that were there that were incorrect or just verify that and move on. And that allowed them to sort of scale to much, much, much uh, larger numbers of messages and actually do a lot more uh, efficient uh, 
routing of messages and disaster relief type things um, that, that they were able to do before. Um, another um, problem that we worked with, which is um, sort of an interesting problem that's happening again. A lot of things I'm talking about are US centric just because a lot of the projects initially came from there. It doesn't mean that they're limited. So one of the projects we were working with was one of the problems in the US that's happened in the past five years with you know, the, the economy going down is a lot of homes have been abandoned. People have just left their homes um, because they couldn't pay for them, they had to be evicted, and the homes have gotten abandoned. And they're, because of those abandoned houses, what's happening in the economy in those local areas is, has been going lower and lower. Not just that, crime starts, it's sort of, there have been people who've shown that when you have abandoned properties, crime starts increasing in that area, and there are a lot of bad things that happen. So what the government has done is they have started to create um, these government agencies that are being given money to do something with those properties, to buy the properties, to invest in them, and to, to build something there. The problem with that is that they have limited amounts of money, and they have no idea which properties to invest in, um, because there are too many of them. So they have to figure out which ones are the right um, properties to invest in uh, in order to maximize some goal that they're trying to maximize. And often that goal is community development, increased economy, uh, more business, more people living there. Um, so they, again, came to us and said, you know, we, we have money to invest in these properties. We don't know how to pick them. Um, and um, so what we did was we, we, we got data from um, lots of sort of mortgage data and lots of data from you know, uh, the, the different kinds of people who live there and the community data and the city data. Um, and we were able to kind of build a system for them that wasn't giving them sort of you know, the perfect answer because that's, that's really hard to do. But it would do two things. It would ask them for their priorities. What do you care about more? Do you want to see um, more business developing? Do you want to see uh, more people living there? Do you want to maximize you know, the, the kinds of, of, of uh, people who live there? What, what's your goal? And then based on the goal, kind of show them the impact of, of, of picking different kinds of properties. So if you pick these properties, here's what it would maximize. If you pick these properties. And so it was kind of giving them an idea for how to think about these problems more analytically. Um, and often that's sort of a lot of our projects, what we sort of found is you know, as much as it was about solving the problem, uh, a large part of this was really educating these government organizations and, and nonprofits who aren't really used to doing things this way, educating them and and how to think about these problems. How do you define and even structure and formulate the problems in a more analytical way so that they can then think about them more rationally? Um, another uh, problem that that we were looking at. Um, was with a nonprofit called Nurse Family Partnership. Um, and they're a nonprofit which really works. So they were started about 20, 25 years ago in the US. And they were started with um, people did these randomized control trials about 20 years ago. And they found that if you put a nurse um, together with when, when, a, when a sort of a young, single, unmarried, typically minority in the US and a mother, is expecting a baby, if you put a nurse together with that and, and, and have a nurse visit them once a week, it, the outcomes are better for both the kid and the mother. It's kind of makes sense, it's obvious, you know, because they don't know enough about, about childbirth, they don't know enough about sort of raising kids. If you have a nurse help them through this process, um, it's, it's better for them. Because, and, and again, it's a, you, know, you don't have universal health care in the US, at least not right now. Um, so it, it's that, that's a big. You know, they don't have access to nurses. They don't have access to hospitals. So so they found that that was that, that was a good thing. In the past twenty years, they've been working. They've been growing. They've been you know, doing a lot of work. Last year, um, with you know, I'm sure you guys have heard about all the new healthcare things that are trying to happen in the U.S. And so when that program was being introduced, um, the government was going to put in a lot more money into these types of programs. So the government came to them and said, can you tell us how much impact you've had uh, so we can figure out how much money to allocate for these types of programs for the rest of the country? And they said, uh, I have no idea. You know, we've been doing work. We've been helping all these people. Um, we have no idea what impact we've had um, because we're not, you know, we're not a research organization who's running experiments every day trying to figure out how much impact we've had. We're trying to change uh, people's health and, and improve you know, health for, for kids. 
So they, again, you know, we, we talked to them about, you know, okay, well, you have data on who you've impacted. Let's see if we can figure out a way to evaluate your, your impact. And the problem is there's no good scientific way to really do that. Um, because the kinds of things they care about, so, so we came up with sort of a handful of metrics that, that, that they cared about. There were things like, you know, immunization rates. So how many kids at the age of two are, uh, have had all their immunizations done? Or breastfeeding rates. How many, what percentage of, of mothers are breastfeeding? Is, and so if you looked at some of those metrics and looked at the people who they were, they were working with, how often, what was their rate of, of, of these types of actions, um, it wasn't higher than the average um, in the country. Um, it was lower than the average. So you say, well, they're not having any impact because these people. But if you looked at the kind of people they were treating, um, they were not the people you know, who, who would be the average. They were much, much, much below average. Um, so we couldn't really take the average and figure it out. So what we ended up doing was coming up with a, you know, it's a very well-known sort of methodology in, in, in statistics, uh, in econometrics, where we took people who are similar to the ones who are in this program, but we're not part of this program for different reasons. And, and it's sort of a, it, it's not a perfect methodology. There's lots of flaws in there. So we took people who, who would have been part of this program um, if this program was available to them, but they weren't. And we took that as the control group. And we looked at that um, and said, okay, what's their rate? And their rate was maybe, you know, average 78% immunization rate and 75% breastfeeding rate. And we looked at the people in our program, or in their program, and the rates were, you know, 84% and 88%. So we're kind of able to find comparable groups um, and show at least directionally that they're having this much of an impact, which would then lead to doing more experimental work and kind of giving them at least some idea. Now, it's not perfect for lots of different statistical reasons, but it was better than, than them saying, I don't know how much impact I'm having, which means I don't know how much money to allocate, which often means I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, so there are lots of other examples. I'm happy to sort of talk about them, but the, generally they range from sort of some government problems where how do you better allocate resources towards uh, citizens around um, transportation, around crime, around public safety, around community development, to nonprofits dealing with healthcare, um, education, uh, disaster relief. And the idea was sort of kind of putting all these things together and eventually start bringing together all these organizations and start to build an infrastructure where they can all work together, right? So, one of the, so what we're doing now is building a team uh, at the university who's really focused on taking some of these problems um, and, and kind of building a shared infrastructure where it means having the people who care about these problems, um, having set of tools that are all common to these problems, and then working together to solve some of these things. So one problem that we're actually actively in the middle of working on, it, it's sort of a related um, problem to what we were talking about, um, but also very different. So, so one thing that we're actively working on right now is, um, so there's this research w w which has shown that um, the, the development of, of kids really happens between zero and three years of age. And the kind of language they hear is, it's sort of often, people have been calling it a 30 million word gap. I don't know if I believe in that, but they sort of show that, you know, the, the difference between a well, um, uh, a, a good developed, a well-developed kid versus a not is about 30 million words uh, that they hear in their, in their life or in their early, first X number of years. Um, whether it's 30 million or 3 million or 300,000, basically people have shown that the kind of language you hear between your first three years affects how you develop. And it's not just number of words, it's the kind, you know, it's, how engaged your caregivers and your parents are, how much you go back and forth. Um, so one of the projects were, so, so there's a person who I've been working with, she ran some trials for the past sort of couple of years where what she did was she got a device um, and she gave this little de recording device um, to uh, several parents and they kept the device with them and they recorded the interactions with the kids all day. Um, and what they would do is then every week, a person would go into uh, this house and get the device from them, um, go to the lab, you know, connect this to the computer, download the data, and then run some analysis. And the analysis would count the number of words they hear, um, the number of words the kid is speaking versus the parent, uh, is the TV on in the background, what kind of language is being spoken. Um, they would look at that and then go back to the parent and sit down with them and kind of work with them, say, well, here's what you should do more, you're not speaking enough, you're not taking turns, um, 
and give them different kinds of sort of constructive feedback. Um, what they found over this, this trial, with, with a pretty small trial, about 20, 25 people, there were two of these trials, that the behavior of the parents changed in these three months based on the feedback. And they, so they were speaking more, they were engaging more, they were doing less what's called directives, so like shut up, don't do this, go away, uh, no. They were actually, instead of that, they were engaging and interacting more. The challenge with this problem, as you sort of might have guessed, is one, it's just too slow. The feedback loop takes you know, a week because it's recorded, it's, somebody takes it, downloads it, analyzes it, and then two, it's really expensive to scale because you have to have a person who's looking at this, going back, and giving individual feedback. That's never going to scale to the kinds of people who really need this type of, uh, of, of technology. Um, so what we're working on now is on two things. One is um, building these devices that are a lot more real time. So you're getting this data more frequently, doing this analysis faster, and then giving feedback much, much faster. So the analysis, the goal isn't to do real time analysis because who cares? The goal is um, to really figure out can we give them feedback at the moment where they're doing this interaction. So you can change their behavior instead of telling them a week later, here's what you did wrong six days ago. Um, so we're kind of building towards is, is, I don't know if you guys know the Fitbit, right? So there's this, like this type of thing, right? Um, so if, imagine uh, instead of my, my walking behavior, which uh, this measures, if it was measuring my, my, my speaking behavior uh, or from the kid's perspective, the environment that, that it can account number of words and can give feedback to the parents about, um, well, five more minutes, you can, you know, one more page of this book and, and you're done for the day. So kind of giving them feedback. Um, and, think, think, and so our goal is sort of make one, the analysis more scalable, but then running experiments to figure out what kind of feedback will affect behavior change. How would you change their behavior in a scalable way, not sort of one at a time, individual, a person talking to a person, but how do you make technology scale these type of things? Um, <coughs> And, and the, so the hope is that we can do that. Right now, I have no idea whether it's doable or not. Uh, it's something we're just starting on doing. Um, but those are the kinds of problems where um, it's sort of a complete feedback loop, where you have data about some sort of behavior. You're collecting this data. You're analyzing this data. You're making some predictions about people. And then you're designing experiments where um, you're trying to change the behavior. And what you learn from that goes back into your data and you sort of keep going and getting people sort of hopefully improve um, some aspect of, of their life. So that's kind of, I had some examples um, and that's all I have, but happy to take you know, more questions uh, if you guys have any. And if you want to talk more about these projects or if you have ideas of people you've been working with who might be interested in working on these projects or, or sort of being partners from the government or nonprofit side, I'm happy to, you know, we're not just limited to the US, so we're going to run this program again next year. Um, so happy to sort of, you know, chat about that as well. Thank you.